When we put an exposure meter inside a camera and linked it to a shutter speed and an aperture, did we lose the plot of photography? Cameras are now computers with lenses and when I teach photography the student is more interested in automation and quick answers. Sometimes they don't even know that a correctly exposed image is generated by a shutter speed and an aperture. We live in an age of instant gratification. Whatever we do we want to be expert in a weekend sometimes shorter, because we haven't got time. Therefore, if you have time to release yourself from the shackles of Otto and JPEGs, here are a few tips that I learned 60 years ago, still relevant today even with my high-tech camera. I have been asked, what is an aperture? Just in case you didn't know, it's a hole, or more correctly, the iris of a lens that can be made larger or smaller. It controls the amount of light reaching a sensor, and its size is indicated by an unhelpful set of numbers. It is confusing to realize that a low value lets in more light to the sensor than a higher one. This is because the values are shown as an abbreviation. Working in conjunction with apertures are Shutter speeds, a slightly misleading description, but it controls the amount of time the aperture remains open. Canon uses the term time value, which is perhaps more accurate. Either way, it is shown by a different set of numbers that are easier to understand. Displayed together, we can now see how the two sets of numbers work together and the relationship between them. It is easy to see that shutter speeds double or half the time an aperture remains open. Although by no means so clear, the aperture scale does exactly the same thing, doubling or halving the size of the lens iris. These are the basic set of numbers that were engraved around a lens barrel such as my first camera, an Agfa Select, released way before automation confused everything. They are still there, but now buried somewhere within the computerization of a digital camera, along with other values designed to give greater exposure accuracy, but more confusion and less clarity in trying to understand what is going on. It is easier to understand the logic of exposure control from the basic values. You may have heard the term to increase or decrease the exposure by a stop. A stop is the difference in light intensity by doubling or halving an exposure value. This can be seen from the shutter speed scale, but less so with apertures, but these basic values do the same thing going up or down the scale. Exposure of a photograph can be calculated manually by the photographer or automatically by the camera. Both combine the appropriate shutter speed and aperture, allowing the correct amount of light to reach the sensor for a photograph. These seven values give the same exposure. The value I cannot show is light intensity. Therefore, a sunny day will give a different exposure to a cloudy day. The values going up and down like scales until the correct ones are found, which a computerized camera does in a split second. If this was all that photography required, we could leave the camera on auto just press a button and hey presto! But there are times when we need to understand a bit more about real photography before using other controls for different visual effects. Waterfalls can be photographed with the water frozen or blurred. Which you prefer is not the point, but knowing how to create both is.
allowing you to choose. A fast shutter speed of a thousandth of a second will freeze water. A longer one of, say, an eighth of a second will create blur where there is movement. Leave the camera on auto and you could end up with anything. It is known as the perfect average. For more information on how to achieve this, see my YouTube photo soundbite on shutter speeds. So, what about apertures? Can they improve images in the same way as shutter speeds? They can. But now we enter one of the hallowed halls of real photography that goes way beyond auto, and it is very creative. The photographer can control how much of the image is sharp. A view will have overall sharpness, but a flower looks better if only the bloom is sharp, not the background. This is depth of field, a technique controlled by the photographer. A large aperture gives less depth of field than a small one. Therefore, for the landscape, f16 was used to increase depth of field. For the flower, f2.8 to decrease depth of field. Greater subtlety of depth can be created by experimenting with other aperture values in between. Depth of field does not stop there. A wide angle lens gives more depth of field at any aperture, a telephoto less. For the view, a wide angle lens increases depth of field, ensuring that everything is sharp. For the flower, a telephoto reduced depth of field, making sure that the background was unsharp. Had it been sharp, the flower would simply just merge into it. These techniques were executed on a fully manual camera by adjusting shutter speeds and apertures manually. You then learnt about real photography. These skills can be successfully transferred to today's modern digital camera. With the advent of digital photography, there are techniques that became easier with a digital camera by using some of the other controls on camera menus. In the days of film, if a shoot was inside a church, we purchased a film that picked up the light faster. That was fine, but you had to use the whole film for the shoot. With a digital camera, the speed at which the sensor picks up the light can be increased just for the job. Known as ISO, this should not be confused with shutter speeds, even though there is a connection. It is a simple set of numbers that double between each value, affecting the sensitivity of the sensor. It is widely recognized that 200 ISO is the best setting for quality. It is worth remembering that my clients, many of which are into publishing, do not accept images above this value, except, of course, when there is no choice. There was a similar problem for artificial light. This is known as white balance, but color temperature would be more accurate. Tungsten light is warmer than daylight, but each would require a different film. With digital, this can be changed in the menu, but to avoid using Kelvin numbers, the photographer can use presets for daylight, tungsten and fluorescent. This is essential for JPEGs, but with RAW, you can change your mind in post-production or even correct mistakes. Many photographers set metering to matrix or ESP, which averages the exposure by splitting the image into segments. Again, this risks the perfect average. These days, with electronic finders, the photographer can be a little more adventurous and precise with exposure. An electronic finder shows changes to exposure before the shot is taken.
an optical finder doesn't do this. On some cameras, you can lock the exposure by half depressing the shutter button or press the AEL button before taking the shot. Therefore, I meter using spot, which evaluates the central part of the image and then lock the setting when the exposure looks visually OK. If necessary, I reposition the camera to the required composition and then take the shot by fully depressing the button. It takes a bit of practice, but it is very creative once mastered. No camera as yet can capture successfully an image having a high dynamic range with the single press of a shutter button. There are menu settings for this, but I prefer to underexpose everything, in addition to spot metering that is, by minus 0.3 EV. EV means exposure value. This avoids blown out highlights that are difficult to correct in Lightroom or Photoshop. Instead, I lighten the shadows provided noise does not raise its ugly head. There is HDR, which means High Dynamic Range. Here the camera takes several images in register at different exposures and then blends them together. It tends to look a bit artificial and requires its own dedicated skill, which together with other advanced techniques can wait for another day. Much of this takes time to master, and miles from instant gratification. I choose auto and JPEGs for snaps and social occasions. For publishing and my YouTube productions, I take photographs on program or one of the other mode settings and save to RAW. If perfect artistic pictures could be created at the mere touch of a button, no matter what, we would soon get tired with photography. Creative photography, true creative photography, takes a little longer.